question that is commonly asked is which is better Scrum or Kanban? I am not going to discuss that, but I'm going to make a clarification on it. And the other point, which is the important one, is a lot of people think that Kanban cannot be used, for example, in software development because it has no iterations. So we're going to, uh, to clarify that there's no need of uh, iterations to be able to work effectively. However, Kanban does offer a way in which we can handle something alike iterations, okay? So let's get started. So first off, um, it looks kind of fuzzy over there. I don't know why, but um, if you guys don't mind about the uh, image being a little fuzzy on the side, uh, I think we're okay, or maybe, no, I don't know. I just leave it like that. Okay, so um, I'm going to start talking a little bit about waterfall, and I think it's very important to set up a mindset. So there is this very strong belief in the agile industry, well, with the agile field, that um, waterfall is bad, you know, it's like evil, and, um, and I strongly disagree. Why do I disagree? Because the problem isn't really waterfall. The problem is that we really, most people don't know what waterfall is. So we think waterfall is something like this, right? So we have our big monolithic set of you know, requirements and design and all that stuff that we know. But that's not true. Actually, um, waterfall came from a paper that was written by Winston Joyce in 1970 as part of his uh, PhD research, which was sponsored by the DOD in the US, the Department of Defense in the, D in the uh, US. And what is really interesting is that this is not waterfall. Nowhere did Winston Roy say this is waterfall. This is actually one of the introductory diagrams in his paper. And actually this paper is very easy to find nowadays on the internet. So you just Google it and download it, it's a PDF, and this is not waterfall. So here's where the surprises begin, okay? So taking that into account, we all know that the most popular agile methodology is a scrum and we like it because it's actually cute you know it's nice you have like this very nice looking structure with these loops and you know it's just kind of cute it has like a nice balance it could be probably a piece of art on a wall or something like that there are two reasons why it is popular one of them was a marketing strategy that has to do with certification and all that but if we ignore that why do technical guys love the Scrum? Well, there's two reasons. One of them is, oh, now it's going to be hard for the stakeholders who have nothing to do with the project to come and bug me. So I can go head down and focus on adding value. So that's a nice one. That's a biggie. I have somebody who's protecting me, right? We know who that is. But the other aspect is this mechanism of having this short periods of time to create and deliver value actually really cool because they help me have a discipline for value delivery, which is much better than having to wait six months or a, a year or so. And an advantage of having that short periodicity on top of creating that discipline and having a this sustainable pace is the fact that at the end of each sprint, there's a demo. And it doesn't matter how outgoing or how shy the technical people might be, because we have all kinds of them. We all, I used to be one of them a long time ago, I used to be a developer. No matter what, we really like showing off. Like, hey, look, I built that thing, you know, that everybody's looking at or using, like, oh, wow, yeah. So having this very short periodicity of that kind of feedback of showing off my stuff, you know, we just love it. So that made this very, very cool. And of course, from the customer standpoint, is values being delivered. So that's nice so far. So now taking that into account, let's go back to waterfall. So waterfall is actually really more something like this. So as we go through, through Winston's paper, what we um, realize is that what he's suggesting is actually iterations. He said that diagram well, is just, just an introduction to understand that we have a sequence. 
But what he says is, as we go about doing that, we have to revisit what we're doing. Okay? So this idea of short iterations so that is not new. I just didn't bring something new with that. Royce himself was saying we have to loop, and there's actually some more really cool looking ones. So I put these ones just to make it easy to understand. And not only that, he said you have to do this. If you do this whole thing, you have to do it at least twice. And he also said beware, this is the result of a PhD research. This is academic. This is not to be applied directly as such in the real world. But what happened? Well, we know what happened, right? We are, this reason why we are here. So we know what happened. So I don't need to go, to go beyond that. So, but what I want to point out is you can get very successful organizations and very um, successful products doing waterfall. Of course, you can be more successful if you start maturing that idea. A reason why I'm mentioning this is because maybe some of you and you know, in my line of work, I you know, encounter many customers and potential customers who work on the waterfall approach. And they are like, I'm not sure if I want to do this agile thing or this lean Kanban stuff, I don't know. So if they are like die hard waterfall, then we can tell them then why, are, why aren't you doing this? You want to continue do what, doing waterfall, then do it right. And to do it right, you have to start going, going this route. And you know what that means. It's going to be easier for us to start bringing new elements that are going to maybe approach more effective. So we shouldn't see waterfall as the, you know, the evil enemy or whatever. It's, we can actually help mature that. So even organizations who don't want to adopt Agile can be benefited if we start bringing this in a gentle fashion. Okay? And I think that's huge, you know, particularly in, in you know, certain companies and some customers, you know, they're, they're really hard to, to convince. So these arguments will make it easier for you, okay? All right, so, so far so good. Um, now, so we all talk about time boxing. You know? A lot of people say we're doing Agile, they're really not doing Agile, they're just doing the Scrum. The Scrum and Agile is not the same thing. Do you agree? Agile is a mindset. Scrum is a, is a methodology. And something that is, uh, you know, very characteristic of these approaches is time boxing. So why do we do time boxing? What's the advantage of that time boxing beyond, you know, what I mentioned uh, for Scrum? Well, what we have on the, on, you know, to begin with is whip limits. And some people say, wait a second, Master, um, whip limits has nothing to do with uh, Scrum, for example. That's an, a lean or a Kanban thing. You know, in Kanban you have whips, but you don't have that in, in a Scrum. And that isn't true. We actually have always have a whip limit with a Scrum. We just don't call it that way. <laughs> you know, the whip limit is the number of tasks, or the number of user stories, that we have on our sprint backlog at the beginning of the sprint. That number of tasks that we have is a whip limit. Why? Because I'm saying this is the maximum number of tasks that I'm going to work on during this sprint. Yes, we don't have whip limits anywhere else, but the entire scrum structure has a whip limit. And of course, something that is interesting in this case is that whip limit changes sprint after sprint because what we keep fixed is not the whip limit, it's the velocity or, or accuracy of that, of that kind. However, Something that is important with the time boxing approach is that we have whip limit, okay? There's also another aspect, which is small batches. The fact that we have a, a, a small time box obviously forces us to have a small amount of work to, to do. And having a small amount of work to do means we wanna have a small batch. What is the advantage of having a small batch? Well, the advantage is that it allows us to focus more easily on getting a small amount of work well done, which is much better than doing a large amount of work poorly done. And there's also a psychological advantage. And uh, it, if you don't believe me, just, just try it yourself, either with yourself or <laughs> experiment with someone else. Um, just give someone a small amount of work to do, a tangible amount of work, like put a pile of paper or something and say, you have to do all this work. 
and then give another person like four, five, six times that amount of work. And be very observant of the uh, body language, you know, the facial expressions. And what you will notice is that there's actually a reaction of stress in the person who gets this big chunk of work to do. And they will go like, whoa, like, hey, you know, what's going on? If it's a small amount of work, like, oh, okay, cool, yeah, nah, I can do it. So just for the, from the purely psychological standpoint, having a large amount of work to do already starts lowering quality because I am, I'm already stressed even before I began, and that affects quality. Then we have the, the uh, periodic delivery. So again, the fact that we know the benefit of, of being able to provide a small amount of value and being able to either get you know, feedback from the, from the customer or getting you know, some feedback from the, uh, the test side of things or the user acceptance test, etc. This periodic delivery allows me to more quickly be able to know whether I'm doing okay or not. So that's an advantage. And as I mentioned, it brings discipline, which is, I think, the, the biggest advantage of having uh, sprints. But there's a small problem. Small, big problem, okay? If we're working with the sprints, the sprints have absolutely nothing to do with providing the best value to the customer, and it has absolutely nothing to do with um, really uh, taking into account how the customer is appreciating the value or if he's actually getting the value the way that is best for him. The sprints have everything to do with just bringing a discipline of work towards the team. So Scrum is really cool from the development standpoint towards the team, but towards the customer beyond the fact of getting this benefit of, of getting this you know, value every you know, two or three weeks. There's nothing else, and that's dangerous, okay? Because the customer, after a while, after a while it could happen. I say, well, you know, it's, it's nice. I appreciate what you're doing, but it's not really giving me the best I could get. So you will start having some problems there. So what we have to understand is that one size doesn't fit all. We cannot just say, I'm going to create something, and whatever it is, I just encapsulate it in two weeks, and I'm going to deliver it to you whatever. You, I'm just happy that I have the discipline and I can deliver to you. And the news is, it's not about us. <laughs> it's about the customer. So what we need to do is that which really satisfies the customer, that which really increases the value that we are delivering to the customer. So, excuse me. So what I'm saying is that whereas, yes, there is value on having sprints and being able to, to deliver, there is something even better that we can do for the customer. So I am not saying that Scrum is bad. I am not saying it's, it's wrong. You know, I have, I mean, I, I still do it. You know, I have customers with whom we work on the Scrum, um, uh, you know, framework. But we mature that to be able to deliver better value. So what I want to, to bring into this, um, you know, with this talk, is for you guys to realize that they, they, we can do even better than that. So this is pretty good, but let's not stop there. Let's take the next step, okay? And what we realize, hopefully everybody at the end of this talk, is that even if we're talking about Kanban, iterationless approach, you know, we will learn that this can be applied into Scrum as well, okay? So let's just, let's just go the next step. Let's, let's do even better for the customer, okay? That's, that's what I'm trying to, to bring into this talk. All right. So <clears throat> what happens? You know, we want to fix things into a sprint. So what do we do? Well, we have, you know, uh, we have epics and we break them down into stories. And we just keep on breaking down until they fit into a sprint. And if they don't fit into a sprint, then we have to be creative. And what we try to do is make sure that we don't do that. So it would be really nice if we could have stories that can be completed in between one and three days. You know, that's, you know, from the technical standpoint, that's ideal. Uh, for example, LinkedIn um, in Mountain View, California, their, their IELTS uh, implementation is 
more than impressive. And they work mostly with the Scrum. They do some Kanban. And the story points, maximum size is eight points. And the maximum amount of time to deliver these stories is three days. Most of them are between one and two days. So that's a nice thing to do. However, maybe sometimes this is a little too much. Maybe this idea of breaking things down, I mean, uh, you know, from the technical standpoint, it's okay. But when you talk about the story, trying to break it down into smaller chunks might ma make things just harder rather than easier. So we have to be careful about that. Um, so what do we do? Well, typically, you know, the considerations are let's use variable speeds, right? So some, so we, we change our speed for our uh, sprints as we go along to adjust to, you know, the, what we want to deliver because we just can't fix things in to what we have. So that's one strategy that is used uh, to deal with this kind of situation. Another strategy has to do with generating different kinds of requirements. So then we say, okay, this kind of requirement, it always has to fit within a sprint. This other one is okay if it takes two sprints and so on. So we start being some sort of flexibility, but with discipline. And one way to do it is just we have, we classify different kinds of requirements. So that's another strategy. Um, and another one is well, what I mentioned. We can just say, let's, let's leave this um, the story to bleed to the next the sprint, okay? So basically, we are acknowledging that in the real world, things are not as pretty as they look just in the diagram or as it was written in the book. You know, we had to we had to accept the natural philosophy of things. That is, we had to accept the way the real world works. And in the real world, things are not that pretty. So we had to adjust, and we start being creative to be able to fit to fit things into that structure. So there has to be a better way to do this. Okay. So <clears throat> what can we do? No, the big question is, okay, so yeah, that sounds kind of interesting, but what else is there? What is it that, 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 that we can do? And why, why do we want to do it? So, what we have to take into account, first of all, is when we're dealing with knowledge work, and, and you know, specifically if we're talking about software development, we cannot see inventory. You know, if we were working at a factory, we can see the accumulation of work. But when you are talking about software development, you don't know. I mean, just go back to work, you know, and ask your manager, what is the amount of our design and process inventory? And he will look at you as if you just got a big hit on your head and you have no clue what you're talking about, because he's going to say it doesn't make sense what you're asking. But it does make perfect sense. There's a humming, right, from the, from the sound. Excuse me, there's a home in there. He's on the cell phone, he's still paying attention to work. <laughs> All right. Hey, girlfriend, hold on. Um, so, so, what we have to understand is that even the fact that we cannot see it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. There is actually an inventory that we're accumulating on different steps of the process. And what this means is that what we have to do is we have to make sure that the flow of value throughout the entire process is the best possible one. And that's something that we actually, uh, we're not used to taking care of. We're used to saying, I have a limited amount of work that I'm going to, to, to uh, take care of during two, three weeks or whatever my sprint size is. But we really don't care about how that is worked within the sprint itself. You know, how do the designers, developers, testers, and all then go about doing that work within the sprint, we don't care. It's like, oh, it's autonomy, go and do it. You know really well how to do it and go and have at it. And yes, autonomy is excellent, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't figure out a way to improve the way we're actually creating that value within the sprint, for example, okay? So what that means is that we have to understand that there's, uh, there's aspects to consider when we're talking about queues. So, what happens? Well, depending on the size of our queue, we can run into this. So if our queue increases, then we have a longer cycle time, which means it takes longer to finish the work. We increase the risk, obviously, because the, the larger the amount of work that we have to work on, 
there is, there is more to consider. And then risk accumulates. There is more variability. Something inside that amount of work has some sort of issue, or there's a variation. That variation can trigger other, other variation. So then that also accumulates. There is more overhead. A thing that we see with large projects, even with a small batch size, if we start increasing it, even if it's within a small range, we start having overhead. And this compromises quality. Why? Because I, I begin to focus more on the amount of work than on the quality of the work. Okay? And of course, people uh, lose motivation. So we have to be very careful about that. And what, what does that mean? Well, what that means is that we have to reduce that size. Why? Well, to, to, uh, to attack those issues. Okay? So we, have, we want to reduce all those aspects. But one important point is actually the feedback and improves efficiency. Okay? So how can we manage the, the handling of that within the execution? And how can we deliver to the cluster in a way that is reasonable? Well, so what we can do is actually to decouple. What, what is it that we are used to? What we are used to is, okay, here comes a sprint, okay? So everybody ready. And so we have to get the customer or the representative of the, of the customer, my PL, to say, okay, so I have to have my backlog ready and I have to decide what I want to propose to be done. So then the team takes it and we do the sprint backlog and so on. You know, we just move on. Um, I'm using Scrum as example because it's very clean for explanation, but this applies to, to other approaches as well. The point is, in the real world, you know, let's say that for some reason the product owner is on vacation and the customer for some reason is unavailable, we finish the sprint, we're ready to take over and we don't have anything to take. Or we don't know if the, if the value is up to date and so on. So there's a problem we have in this synchronization that happens in the real world. So what will happen if we can decouple that? And also what will happen if we could decouple the value creation with the value delivery? Well, that level of flexibility will make it a lot easier for us to deliver better value to the customer and to reduce dependencies. So this is what we can do. We start, getting, uh, we start decoupling. And a way to decouple is you know, beginning to, to bring elements into our approach. So either you know, we, we can just say, well, let's just go the Kanban route because Kanban already includes all, all that. But what if we're not doing Kanban, or we don't want to, or we can't, or you know, this, this particular team has like, you know, some allergy you know, to, towards Kanban, and we cannot do it because it itches. Um, well, what we can do is just bring elements that make it easier to, uh, to do this. And the decoupling can happen in different ways. So what if we were to decouple not only the fact of when we get the requirements and when we deliver, but also what would happen if we can decouple you know, all sorts of activities in such a way that we get the best possible value flow? Well, we have to consider always the economic factor. So what, is, what are the economic reasons behind the agile methodology? What are the economic reasons behind an approach like Kanban? What are the economic reasons behind you know, wanting to decouple? So we're used to saying, I finish a sprint and I deliver. And over time, you know, it, it, it became accepted the fact that we can actually do a different kind of, of delivery that has an economic reason, which is my MMFs, okay, my minimal marketable features. Well, another economic reason could drive us to do an MMR. MMR is minimal marketable release. And what that means is what we're going to do to determine our MMR is to consider the transaction cost of the release and the uh, cost of my cycle time. Why is that important? Because we're talking about money in the end. So maybe doing deliveries after each time box, the sprint or whatever it is, can become a little too costly. And we are actually delivering something that is not really ready for the customer or that the customer isn't ready to take. So then why do it? It doesn't make sense from the economic standpoint to do it. From the functional standpoint, yes. From the process standpoint, yes. From the economic standpoint, hmm, question mark. Okay? So we, we have to start taking that into account. So then what we have is that if we have a process, a given process, whatever it is, in this case this is a uh, Kanban, but whatever it is, what we have to take into account is how can I go about 
deploying my value and being able to deliver it in a way that makes sense. And, and, and let me give you an example. So in this case, this is a process for a customer care organization. And so we have different tasks going on. We have uh, two teams working in parallel. And we get to this point, and I think it's very clear that where we have more tasks accumulated are exactly at the last column. And the last column is, guess what? User acceptance. So we have this work happening and this accumulation of, of work. And what does that mean from the economic standpoint? What that means from the economic standpoint is that nothing is being really done. Meaning, if the objective of what we're doing is to deliver a benefit to the customer in terms of value, the customer is receiving zero value. It's just not going beyond this. It's, it's not being delivered. In this case in particular, it's not being delivered because the customer itself is not doing its job. So in a regular approach, you would say, hey, well, here it is, and you're not taking it. That's your problem. I don't care. But we should care because basically, if we're doing all this work, spending all this time and uh, you know, effort and money, <clears throat> To do something that is never going to benefit the customer, what we are doing is we are creating waste. <clears throat> and what benefit does it have to generate waste? Nothing, none, okay? So these customers say, okay, Master, we don't know what to do here. Very simple. Take a photo of this, email it to the customer, call them up and say, you know what? You are not doing your part, therefore there's no value being obtained. Um, from your end. So what we are going to do is we're going to finish what we are doing right now because we are not going to leave things half done. You know, it's, it's, it's not a good practice. Um, <clears throat> it has no economic value. But we are not taking any new tasks to work on because we are wasting our time. So we're just working on this and then we're going to start working on something for another customer. Once you're ready for us, then we, we come back to generating value. Two hours after that phone call, this was smaller. Okay, the customer realized that the value was being generated but was not being received by him. So what can we do, you know, instead of having to do this, how can we just be proactive and, and make sure that this doesn't happen? Well, so there is something that is called cadence. Uh, Henry Niebuhr, mentioned the word cadence during his talk. I know if some of you attended his talk, he mentioned that. So I'm going to dig deeper into this because it's a very powerful point. So cadence has to do with being able to deliver value in a way that actually has economic sense. And what this means is that we can have more than one cadence established to deliver that value. And we can take into consideration different aspects. So these are some of them that, that we can take into consideration. So let's think about this, okay, let's say, you know, I'm a I am a very lazy person, and I don't like you know, doing my laundry. So I say, well, you know what? I'm just going to hire a laundry service. So I call these guys up, you know, the, the uh, superlaundry.com, 100% you know, customer satisfaction. So I call them up, and they say, oh, yes, uh, Mr. Maeda, absolutely. We make sure that you get the best satisfaction ever. We deliver great value. So. What would you like us to take care of? Well, my personal clothing, bed sheets, tablecloth, curtains. All right, yeah, we can do that. And uh, you can trust us entirely. So even if you're traveling, you know, we can, you know, get into your house, take everything that needs to be taken care of. And we bring everything back to you every three weeks. And they go, well, you know what? I mean, for the tablecloth, it's okay. Um, the, Bedding, maybe, I'm not quite sure, but personal clothing, having to wait three weeks, I really don't think I like that. I mean, it just doesn't work for me because I will have to buy a lot of clothes and I'll have like a ton of clothes waiting, you know, and that doesn't work for me. So then they say, oh, yes, you're right, no problem. As we say, 100% customer satisfaction. So now we're going to deliver everything to you every three days. Um, yeah, that satisfies the personal clothing, but uh, you know, having my curtains, like you know, every three days taken care of, is a little like overkill. I'm not quite sure. That's what happens with the with the current approaches. 
you know, is one fixed time box to do everything. So that's, that brings discipline into the team, but that is not really satisfying the customer need. So what if we were to start understanding what it is that the customer wants? And one way to do that is, let's say, we have different kinds of tasks. So instead of having one kind of task within my, uh, my, value, flow, my value generation, I understand the different kinds of tasks that we are working on. And then we make it explicit. And then what if we say, what will happen if instead of having a time box for everything, we determine a time box depending on what it is that the value of these different kinds of tasks bring? That's point number one. Point number two, what will happen if we do this in an intelligent fashion instead of just making it up? They're just going, ah, I think this will be the, okay. No, 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 no. What if we actually have a way to really understand that which is what the customer will, uh, will satisfy, the, what, that way which will satisfy the customer better? So, and also understand that this can be applied to anything. So this is, for example, in software development, you could have something like this. Your urgent tasks, you know, the, the unavoidables, <laughs> something urgent is going to happen every now and then. Work that has to do with um, uh, uh, tasks that the customer doesn't perceive. We're adding a new server rack, updating the database, stuff like that. We have work that needs to be finished on a, in a specific day. Oh, we need this for Valentine's Day, so this functionality has to be there. Or just in every other task. What if we could have a way to really maximize the value, the way we deliver that value in, with the best economic uh, terms? And also being able to do this for any kind of context. So this is, for example, for business development. And all these are real cases. The first one is very typical for development. This is for a company that uh, you know, has a large uh, customer base. This is a solution for a hospital. And this is a real thing. So we have a different way to treat and deliver value when we're talking about an outpatient versus an inpatient, administrative tasks, and so on. Imagine if somebody comes into the emergency room, and I know we treat one patient every two days. Just wait there, it's okay. Hey, I'm dying here. Yeah, just wait, don't worry. So, you know, we have to, we have to be realistic. So, how do we get into that realistic uh, point? Well, we quantify, okay? We are used, if we are very much into, um, into Agile and Scrum, to do a lot of qualitative evaluation. We, are, we kind of start stepping away from quantitative. But it's actually good to go back and taking that into account. So if we quantify, we're going to have a huge advantage. But not only that, when we quantify, we have to be careful to quantify properly. So we are used to saying, okay, I have my, you know, somewhat Gaussian curve with my sigmas, and based on that, I can know, you know, what my, my variation is and I can make promises to my customer based on that. But most of the times we made the mistake of quantifying only up until here, just this part, or this part here, or this part here, or this part here. So the curve is, you know, it can be quite uniform or it can just lean a little bit over one side or the next. And we could say, okay, I have the idea of what my behavior is, for example, of how how long the tasks that I'm working on, how long the, 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 the user stories that I'm working on are taking to be delivered. Yeah, I start quantifying that. If I only take this main curve and I say, I'm going to take my one sigma, for example, and then I'm gonna tell the customer, um, Mr. Customer, 93% um, of the tasks, the, the user stories that we are creating um, we're going to deliver to you every seven days or less. Okay, that's better than saying we're going to deliver 100% of them every 15 days or less. Because the customer will say, well, 15 days is probably a little too much. Seven days sounds kind of cool, even if it's not 100%. And then we will say, well, we're quantifying, so we're safe. Yes, we're delivering. And what we will realize is that after a while, the customer will be very unhappy because we are actually not delivering as promised. I say, oh, you lied to me, you know? I don't like that, you know, I don't like being taken advantage of. 
And it's not that we were taking advantage of the customer, it's just that we, we weren't taking into account the whole story. And the whole story is taking into account your full data set. Because what you will see is that in the real world, this is the behavior. All these charts are for real things in the real world, in different contexts, okay? This is something from NASA that has to do with gravitational lensing, that has to do with, uh, something that has to do with uh, supplier evaluation, that has to do with advertisement, this has to, to, to do with customer portfolio management. And what we will see is that we have outliers. When we have a main curve, and then we have, it goes down, and then there's a little bit of an extra uh, bump, it goes down, and there's an extra bump. So there's usually like one, two, or more. So if you take a larger um, sampling of your data set, then your promise is going to be realistic. So that, what that means is that we will tell the customer, instead of every seven days, we will say it's every nine days. And even though nine days is longer than seven days, if we are actually delivering as promised, the customer will love you. And that's huge because that increases confidence, okay? And at the same time, we are delivering, you know, in, in, in a way that really works. So what that means is, okay, we can try that out. So how, how do we do it? Well, we can take different approaches. We could take a sampling of everything we do, okay? So let's say in the case of an approach like, like Scrum, we only have just the stories, we don't differentiate. We can take a sampling of everything and make a promise based on that. But we can actually go and do better. And there's different ways to do it. One of them is, you know, the classes of service, the different types of, of uh, tasks that I showed before. Or we could say we have, for example, for a project, we have capacity allocation. So we have one team is working on this, another team on this, and these are other tasks, like defects, infrastructure, whatever. And we quantify. And we could say, well, if we assign a specific kind of functionality to team one, and we understand the way that team one behaves, then we can make a promise based on that. So we could tell the customer, you know, this kind of functionality is going to be delivered to you every nine days or less. This other kind of functionality is going to be delivered to you every uh, five days or less. And this work, we're, gonna, we're always going to make sure that it's done uh, every 48 hours or less, and this is done every half a day or less. What does that do? That actually increases the discipline within the team. It makes it easier to understand the work we have to do. It makes it a lot easier to make decisions. And we actually deliver in much better value. And what's the result of this? The result of this is that the time of delivery is going to start getting better over time. So for example, you look at this graph here, or this graph here, what you will see is that these lines which indicate time, start getting shorter over time. And what does that mean? Well, that means that um, this project that we will finish sooner, we actually finish it more sooner. Or if not, at least you know, we're going to get better quality. So basically what this means is that we do this capacity allocation and we apply the concept of cadence, we're gonna have a really nice improvement which was impossible to obtain before. Before, the only thing we could do is we're here, we apply something like this Chrome, we had a really, ni really nice improvement, and it, then it goes almost flat. It, it, it improves, but very slightly. So everybody's really excited because like, wow, look at this big improvement, you know, we have sprints and so on. But then what happens? You know, it's the same thing, it's the same rhythm, it's the same modus operandi. What, what else is there? Whereas here, we have a way to actually start going and doing better and better, okay? So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's very, very important to consider. So again, um, we can apply this to any kind of approach. So for example, if you're talking about Scrum, what could you do? Well, something that you can do is improve your, your board. You have, you have your board, and instead of just having uh, to do doing and done, the doing part, visualize it better. That doesn't mean that you're going to make it wireful style, that you have development and testing and so on you could actually have a board in which you have, you're doing um, a column, and then subdivide that column in sections. And then you visualize where it is that you are within that development part. Are you doing uh, unit testing? Are you, are you developing test code? Is, is actual development going on? You know, what, what, what is happening with it? Um, and 
that increasing on visualization added to identifying the different kinds of tasks will allow you to start doing this kind of quantification. So imagine that instead of being thin, you say, oh, these are, um, say, my regular tasks, these are my fixed deliveries, these are my urgents, etc., and you quantify that. What will happen? No? What will happen with the urgent tasks? Well, it, instead of being treated ad hoc, as usual, we could establish a discipline behind it, which would be something like, you know, if an urgent task comes, what we have to do is, you know, we look at it immediately, we determine what needs to be done, we pull out the resources that, that are necessary in the order that is adequate, we keep a log of, the, of that behavior, and then we quantify. And then at the end of that, uh, once we finish and, you know, deliver that solution, that's not the end of the story. We're going to do root cause analysis. We do root cause analysis and we determine which variation that generated that urgent task can be tackled. What it is that we can do so that this kind of variation either doesn't happen or has a lower impact. So that the next time we have an urgent task that has something like this one, we can tackle it better. But then eventually, some urgent tasks will stop happening thanks to this. So we start having that kind of improvement and we will see it because if we quantify, we will see that let's say your typical urgent task takes six hours to, to be resolved. Then eventually, similar urgent tasks will take five hours, then maybe four, then maybe less, and so on. And that's what we want to do. So what does that mean? Well, that the value to the cost, the, the delivery of value to the customer is being more efficient without us having to work harder. You know, we're just working smarter. And we're still, you know, keeping our, our approach of, you know, the way we do things. Okay. Okay, so this has to do with Kanban. Um, which doesn't mean you cannot do it with Scrum. <laughs> so what those numbers mean is the maximum number of tasks that you want to have at that step. And this is what, you know, at the beginning of the of the talk I mentioned that in Scrum you have only one week limit, which is the number of tasks on your sprint uh, backlog, backlog at the beginning of the sprint. So what you can do is granularize that. You can indicate, I want that for design, I can only have a maximum of four tasks at a given time, for development five and so on. And also there's a criteria that helps us determine how to do this. There's not a magic formula as to, if you have these resources or this condition, this is the right number. Th that doesn't exist because it depends on, on, on it's a case by case thing. But what is important is that you can make story or whatever it is that you have, you know, use case, whatever, flows from the beginning of your process to the end of your process in the best possible way. That's what you want because, again, what matters is the delivery of value. Okay? Okay, thanks. Um, your, the best thing that you can do, independently of whether you're doing Kanban or not, I mean, in the end it doesn't matter, it really makes a lot of sense if what you do is make sure that your board reflects your current reality. What is my process right now? That's what I want to visualize. I don't want to visualize what is documented. I don't want to visualize the idealization of my process. I want to know exactly what's happening at this very moment. That's what I visualize. So if you visualize that, then you're going to understand what's going on and, uh, and the information, well, do you, you guys agree that this is an information radiator? So in the end, it's a way to visualize what's going on. Then, you know, I have a rich way to visualize my reality. And the advantage of doing that is then, Whatever I encounter that something is not doing is not going quite right or that it could go better, then that's an opportunity for improvement. And I can say, okay, now let's analyze this, let's get let's explore it, let's get into detail. And how do you do that? Well, if you're quantifying and if you have a log of activity behind that task, 
or you know behind you know the behavior of your of your entire section then it's more e it's easier to determine you know or to understand what's going on and then figure out a solution so what is important here also is this is not going to give you the solution okay it's never going to give you the solution this just makes it evident that something is going on there and it's up to you to figure out how to solve it Yes. Yes, this is a Kanban board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, okay, thanks. Um, so, the first thing to understand is that Kanban is not a software development process, okay? You can apply Kanban to a process that already exists, but you cannot say Kanban is my process. So something is already there, and you use Kanban to visualize that and then start working on it. So if your process has iterations, then that's fine. Kanban says good, there's iterations here. If your process says there's no iteration, Kanban says great, there's no iteration. So talking about Kanban being iteration or iterationless for the purpose of that doesn't really make sense because it's entirely independent of Kanban. But what we are saying here is that you can actually use Kanban and the information that you have, the, the information they provide to quantify the behavior and then be able to make decisions. And one of those decisions that you can establish is a cadence for value delivery. Now, this is based on, um, you know, this quantification. So you're not saying that what you have is what one person is doing, is the behavior of your system. So the system's behavior is what allows you to establish that cadence. It's not, it's not one person versus the next, because that really doesn't matter. We don't care if it's Bob or James who is doing it. What we care is for this type of work, what is, the, what is the, that behavior that allows us to make a promise to the customer. You start applying this to Scrum, for example, you can get rid of the strings because the cadence, or the different cadences that you have replaced the string. Uh, uh, Henrik actually he mentioned this also in, uh, during his talk. You know, that you, that, you know, that why are we doing the strings if we have this? You know, we have a cadence. So it's a different way to bring discipline. And actually something, I, I'm going to take advantage to mention this. If, you, if any of you, you know, in your organization, you have a team or your team, is already a very highly effective, very mature Scrum team there to remove the sprint. The moment you remove the sprint, the productivity is going to go up. Because the sprint, what it did was bring the discipline, but if the discipline is already there, it actually starts being an element of friction. Like, you know, we could do more, but now we are limited. So you, you could try that, you know, and many teams have done it and they, they get shocked by the improvement. Okay, so um, yes, uh, you want to mature your board, and yes, you want to mature, you know, that that, that status. So basically, what this means is, if my, if I have a project and I have a visualization of the project through a Kanban board, I'm hoping that everybody on the one we end up getting into a really interesting discussion. Um, a project changes over time. The behavior of a project changes over time. It doesn't, it doesn't behave the same way at the beginning, at the middle, towards the end. If the Kanban board is a fingerprint of my current process, that means the Kanban, is, the Kanban board is going to change shape. Uh, and then what you're doing is bringing continuous improvement, but that also means 
that uh, down the road, as you observe your behavior, you may come to the decision of changing the width. Beware, the moment you do that, all your previous quantification is no longer valid, you start anew, which is okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yes, it is true that you have, you know, the similar the size, well, the, the more predictable it is, right? I mean, that's, that's a nice, safe way to, to do things. But we have to observe the fact that that is not, that not going to happen. And if I force to break things down to that, I may get into more trouble than not. And that will have all these samples. So you have different tasks, but I should probably put this one up here to make it easier to see, because this one is a bunch of dots. But what you see there is that different tasks are, different, are taking different time. Or like here, for example, these are they. So if well, you know, this satisfies customers' uh, demand within a certain range of time, there are some demands that take longer, and some that take longer. So we have different size tasks, and I would dare to say it's not really the size of the task, you know? It's, it's the complexity of the task, you know? So, it, it can be a small one, but it could be a really hard one to, to take care of, and it takes a long time to, to work. Okay? All right, so, um, we're actually a pretty good time. Huh. Um, so, then just, we're getting to the conclusion. So, just to, you know, to graph things up, it's important to take into account different variables to be able to do the decoupling. Okay, so just consider different alternatives and then make a decision and act accordingly. Do I want to decouple, you know, the way things get into my system, you know, the, 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 uh, how frequent or in which way the customer tells me what I need to work on, what I work on, and then how I deliver. Do I want to decouple that? Do I want to take into account, you know, the size of what I'm doing, the complexity, um, depending on the shape of my board, do I want to do it based on uh, how I'm allocating my capacity, etc. So you have to make a decision on that and then establish your cadences based on it. What is important is that the customer is going to be way happier. Why? Because I'm getting my personal coding every three days and my bedding every week and my table coding every two and my curtains every three months. I'm a lot happier with that because I don't feel like I'm being fooled and I'm overpaying, you know, for the service. Um, there is also less work for the customer. If I force, you know, like in the sprints, that every two weeks something has to be there, it's like, hey, wait a second, you know, I cannot, that, uh, that doesn't work with me. You know, the way I operate or my needs are such that I cannot do that. So I, I appreciate that it's good for you, but it does, it's not working for me as a customer. But if I decouple that, then I as a customer can provide to you what needs to be done in a way that works for me, without affecting the way you have to do your work, okay? And of course, it increases the, the team's productivity because we are actually doing the work not only just based on, on, on the number of tasks uh, per uh, time box, but we're actually doing, doing it in terms of the kind of work that needs to be done because of the value they provide to the customer, okay? So, nonetheless, we have to still keep those good practices which have to do with considering a small batch size that's a good thing to, to, to do, um, you know, establish the, the cadences. And, uh, you know, for people who are in, a, in an agile environment, you are already familiar with the fact that value is more important than time. So those who are new to, to this, uh, you know, to, to agile and lean, it's very important to understand that time begins to lose importance as you mature your organization and your value delivery. Okay, so that's all I have. Uh, is there any more questions? Please do. Let, let me. Okay. 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 So what what I what I refer to specifically uh, with this dependency is the dependency of you as a customer having to give things to me in, in, in a given phase, which is the one that works for me as the creator of value. 
So you're, you're the customer and I say, you have to give me something to do every week. Like, well, you know what? I can do it probably once or twice, but then I get busy with something else and I didn't have time to prepare what you need and so on. That's what I'm talking about, is that dependency. So what do you tell the customer? You know what? I just need to have work to do. You know, and in this, this way, this is how I need it. So how you create it and you provide it for me is up to you. And then you can actually help, you know, then make the decision of how to do it. But what is important is that you eliminate that dependency. So you decouple one from the other. Uh-huh. It's good to have small things to do, but, but it's not a good idea to have things smaller than they should. Okay, so you can break it down to a certain point, and if that, that critical point doesn't fit your thing, what do you do, right? So that's what I'm referring to, that you have to be careful about that. Don't, don't, don't make things more complex than they are. If breaking something makes it more difficult, more complex, uh, then you don't want to do that. Right? Yeah. What, do, what does what answer? How do you know it's, it's quantifying? If you, you see your behavior, then you'll know. Because there is no magic number. It depends on your process, it depends on the, pro, uh, on the project, on the kind of product. That depends, you know, it depends on the team. So there is no one number or one range. What you have to do is you, you have your, your, your own uh, context, you quantify and then you determine what to do. But, what, but definitely, definitely, the smaller the device size, the better, up to a limit. And one way to actually um, appreciate this, that, has, that is independent of hard quantification, is the stress level. You, if you have a, a large batch size, what you will see that your team is going to be stressed. You start lowering it, it starts getting better, but then you, you keep on lowering it and the stress starts going up again. So you have to be very careful. There's actually an, ex an exercise to do that. Um, and there's an open space. Uh -huh. um, okay, so I'm, I am willing to do this. Um, I'm, I'm going to attend a, a talk after this. But at 5, 5, 5, or 5, um, I don't know where open space is, and I know if there's open space at that time. But um, maybe what we can do, just to be on the safe side, once you get to the launch area, you go to, there's, there's these rooms and the other rooms, right? And then the elevators are on this side. You go exactly the opposite way. There's like uh, some sofas there. I'm going to go back to my room and bring down, uh, you know, a game that we can play to understand this point. Okay, of the stress level. So I will be down there probably 505. Okay? That's an interesting question. Um, hmm. No. No, I mean, that's, that, that was an early belief just because Kanban was born there. But, uh, I mean, let me tell you, uh, my company, more than half our customers are not even software or IT. So we have applied this into so new projects, new software projects, existing projects, uh, software projects, IT, healthcare. So what I show you there is actually projects that we have worked on. Uh, healthcare, education, telecom. Uh, so, yes. No. Um, I'm trying to think where we have encountered particular problems. Uh, what I have encountered is different challenges. I mean, I, I could not say this particular context is harder than the other. I really don't know. You know, I, you know the, the one that I'm actually curious about is one that we haven't had the opportunity to put our hands on. The, 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 the proposal is on the table, but it hasn't been approved yet, and it's for to exploit a, a copper mine uh, using this. But uh, I mean, within a bit in, say, software and IT, 
I, I haven't seen really saying there's, a, there's actually a pattern. I haven't seen that. Maybe there is, but I haven't seen it. Yes. 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 And, and, and actually, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you one right now. So I, I have this team. They are doing the Scrum. And they are being effective. I definitely been effective in doing the Scrum. But it was clear to me that, again, the way the value was being generated was entirely ad hoc. And I wasn't happy with the amount of value. The, it, it was like, this team can do much better. So the only thing I did was, you know, one day I, I took a post-it. So. No, no, no. They, they were delivering value. They were delivering value. OK, they think it. But you observe the behavior, and you don't see a pattern of behavior. What you see is that they are just doing something. I can do something else right now, take this task, do some testing go back to development, do some design. So you see that they are taking tasks and working on them, but there is no pattern. So basically what they do is, I have 15 days to finish this amount of work, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get it done the best possible way. Of course, so we, we, we don't want to compromise quality, but that's it. Is your talk? Oh, perfect. Okay, we're out, we're out. Let's talk outside.